In Module 2, we study the final method for solving a set of equations that we deal with in this course. That method involves finding the inverse using the determinant and cofactors of the matrix of coefficients. This is known as the adjoint method. We'll also see how the inverse of the matrix of coefficients can be interpreted to give us some useful information about the system of equations. We'll finish the module by briefly looking at geometric interpretations of matrices and inverses. As we saw in Lecture 11, we can solve a system of equations by finding the inverse of matrix. There we found the inverse using Gaussian reduction. Here we'll look at another method. Before we do that, let's refresh our memory on some definitions. If we have a square matrix A, a minor results from eliminating a row and a column centered on a particular element of the matrix. The minor is the determinant of the remaining submatrix. Remember also that a determinant is a scalar. If we give the minor the appropriate sign, we get the cofactor. The formula for getting the sign is minus 1 to the i plus j, where i and j are the row and the column, respectively, of the corresponding element. For each element, there's a corresponding minor, and for each minor, there's a corresponding cofactor. In the adjoint method, we find all the cofactors for a matrix. We then collect all the cofactors in a matrix, naturally called the matrix of cofactors. That's designated C+. Plus. The cofactor in the 1, 1 position, for example, is the one that we calculate by first eliminating row 1 and column 1. Once we have the matrix of cofactors, we take the transpose. That gives us the adjoint, or the adjugate, of A. Now there's only one more step to get the inverse. We divide the adjoint matrix by the determinant. Since the determinant is a scalar, that means we divide each element of the adjoint by the determinant. We can expand that out. We start with matrix A. To find the inverse, we calculate the determinant and then the adjoint. Notice the subscripts of the cofactors here, 1, 2, down to 1n. So those are the cofactors from the first row of A. Recall, this matrix is C plus transpose. Here are the formulas for the cofactors and the determinant cofactors and determinant. An important thing to remember when we're calculating the cofactor we don't multiply by the corresponding element. That only occurs when we're calculating the determinant. Multiplying the cofactors in the adjoint by the corresponding elements is a mistake that students sometimes make in exams. Here we have a summary of the method of solving equations by finding the adjoint. First we find the determinant then we find all the cofactors, we put them into the matrix of cofactors, we take the transpose to find the adjoint, we find the inverse of the matrix by dividing the adjoint by the determinant. Once we have the determinant, we can solve for x, y and z. Let's put that into practice with an example. If we have a system of three equations with three unknowns, x, y and z, we'll find the inverse and then solve for the three unknowns. First we get our equations into matrix form. Our next step is to find the determinant of the matrix of coefficients. Since we have zeros in rows 2 and 3, we would choose one of those to expand along. Here we're expanding along row 2. For the first term, we have element 1. That's that one there. So we eliminate row 2 and uh, column 1. That leaves us with a submatrix, so we have the minor there, and then we find the appropriate sign by having minus 1 to the 2 plus 1. Our next element in row 2 is 1. Then we have 1, eliminate row 2 and column 2. Leaves us with a submatrix. We take the determinant to find the minor, and then we have minus 1 to the 2 plus 2, i plus j, that gives us the sign. The last element in row 2 is 0. We have a 0. We eliminate row 2 and column 3. Gives us our submatrix. We don't need to go any further here because we have the 0, but for completeness, there's our sign, minus 1 to the 2 plus 3. We evaluate the minors and do the calculation, and we see that the determinant is 7. So A is non-singular. Our system of equations has a solution. 
Since there's also a zero in row three, we expand along that row. So we have three, zero, and one. Is that three elements with the minors? Of course, we get the same value for the determinant, seven. Either of those expansions would be suitable. So you can expand along rows one, two, or three, or if you prefer, use the Saris rule to find the determinant. Once we have the determinant, we go onto the cofactors. We find cofactor one, one, by eliminating the first row and the first column. And we have the submatrix that's left. We find cofactor one, two, by eliminating the first row, second column, that we have the submatrix, take the minor and the sign, of course. And for cofactor 1, 3, eliminate the first row and the third column, and so on for the rest of the cofactors. So we have a 3 by 3 matrix, and we have 9 cofactors. Here we've put all our cofactors into a matrix, C+. Plus. We take the transpose, so the, the rows become the columns of the transpose. And then we have the adjoint. To find the inverse, we multiply the adjoint by one on the determinant. Rather than dividing each element by seven, we can leave the inverse in this form. It's often simpler to use when we're solving the system of equations. As we saw before, the solution to our system of equations is the inverse of A times the vector of right-hand side constants. So here we're ready to calculate the solutions. Remember, it's rows by columns. So to find x, we multiply the first row by the column vector. 1 times 7 plus minus 3 times 5 plus 2 times 4. So x is 0. Recall that we show that a value is the solution to an equation by giving it a bar or a star. We're solving for x. It gives us x equals 0. Similarly for y bar, we'll have 1 7 times the second row by the column vector. And for z, 1 7 times the third row times the column vector. So we have our solutions there x is equal to 0, y is equal to 5, and z is equal to 4. Now let's see how we derive the adjoint formula for the inverse of a matrix. First we introduce the idea of expansion by alien cofactors. We know the formula for the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix A. Here we're expanding along row 2. What happens if we multiply the cofactors by a different row? Say row 1. That means, in effect, this is our new matrix A. We see that row 2 is the same as row 1. In other words, row 1 and row 2 are not linearly independent. If that's the case, we know that the determinant of the new A is 0. And so this is our result. These results are generalised in our textbook as Theorem 16.5.1. We have an n by n matrix A with cofactors C, I, J. In the formula for the determinant, if we expand along a row, then naturally the row index numbers for the elements and the cofactors are the same, as we can see here. Elements have row 2, cofactors row 2. In the general form, then the rows are given by I, and they're equal. That gives us the determinant. If we multiply the elements of a row by the cofactors from a different row, in other words, alien cofactors, then the rows are different. So we'll have i and k, where k is not equal to i. In this example, we had row 1 for the elements and row 2 for the cofactors. The rows are different. So theorem 16.5.1 is just a formal statement of what we've seen. We've looked at rows, but the theorem also holds if we expand down columns. Now that we've established this theorem, we can start to derive the formula for the inverse of a matrix. 
we can rewrite theorem 16.5.1 in this way. It's just a more compact form. If the rows for the elements and the cofactors are the same, i equals k, and we have the determinant, if they're not the same, then our formula yields a value of 0. We can also state the theorem in matrix terms. We multiply the rows in the first matrix by columns in the second matrix, so we need to have the following matrices. Our first matrix is just matrix A. If we multiply row 1 in matrix A, by the column in matrix 2, then that gives us the value in the 1, 1 position, which is the determinant. However, if we multiply row 1 by any of the other columns, for example column 2, then i is not equal to k, and so we have a 0 value. And that applies if we multiply row 1 in a by columns 2 to n in our second matrix. Similarly, if we multiply row 2 by column 2, we get the determinant. If we multiply row 2 by any other column, we get zero values. Now let's look at this second matrix. Well, we can see it's a matrix comprised of the cofactors, so it's a C plus. But let's look at the index numbers. We have 1, 1, 1, 2, and down to 1, n. Of course, these are the cofactors from the first row. So the second matrix is a transpose of the matrix of cofactors. Let's look at the right hand side now. We have a matrix there where the principal diagonal values are all at the determinant A and the off diagonal values are 0. We can rewrite that as the identity matrix multiplied by the scalar, the determinant of A. So we've reformulated theorem 16.5.1. So we have our matrix A times the transpose of the matrix of cofactors is equal to the determinant times the identity matrix. So let's define the adjoint, or the adjugate of A, as being the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. This is the result we just found. A times the adjoint of A is equal to the determinant of A times the identity matrix. We can pre-multiply both sides of this equation by the inverse of A. The inverse of A times A is equal to I. The inverse of A times I is equal to just the inverse of A. So we have the adjoint of A is equal to the determinant of A times the inverse of A. As long as the determinant of A is non-zero, we can divide both sides by the determinant of A. And there we have the adjoint formula for the inverse. Much of what we've done in this and the last two lectures has been matrix arithmetic. I've gone through this proof to give an example of matrix algebra. That is, deriving results symbolically. We'll look at two more examples of matrix algebra in Module 3. Kramer's rule can be derived from the proof we've just seen. Students who are interested can view that proof in a separate video. But to end this module, let's see how we can interpret the inverse of a matrix arithmetically. And we'll also have a brief look at the geometric relationship between a matrix and its inverse. Suppose we have a system of two equations and two unknowns. The inverse of A is this matrix, and here we have the solutions. x1 is equal to 11, x2 is equal to 25. Now let's increase the right-hand side constant for the first equation by 1, so we have 3 plus 1 is equal to 4. The inverse doesn't change, and we get the new solutions for x1 and x2 here. So x1 is now 13 and x2 is 30. x1 increases by 2 and x2 by 5. Where do we see these numbers 2 and 5? Well, here in the first column of the inverse. We can start again and this time increase b2 by 1, so we have 10 plus 1 is equal to 11. And solve for x1 and x2 once more. So now x1 is equal to 11.5 and x2, 26. That's an increase of 0.5 for x1 and an increase of 1 for x2. Once again, we see these numbers in the inverse. They're the second column in the inverse. So we see that the columns in the inverse show us how the solution changes when there's a one unit change in the constant term values.
finish the module, we'll look at some geometric relationships between a matrix and its inverse. We'll consider a 2x2 two two matrix as we can plot it in the xy plane or the r2 plane. That makes it easy to visualise. To plot a matrix, we construct a parallelogram. We consider each row to be a vector. So row 1 in matrix A becomes vector A1, and we plot it here. Row 2 of A becomes vector A2, which we plot here. To construct the parallelogram, we add A2 to A1, so we'll have A2 there, and then A1 to A2. We do the same with the inverse of A. Row 1 of the inverse is A superscript 1, and row 2 of the inverse is A superscript 2. Having plotted the matrix, we can point out some geometric relationships. The area of the pink parallelogram is equal to the determinant of A. There's a proof of this in the textbook. Similarly, the area of the blue parallelogram is equal to the determinant of the inverse of A. And further, the determinant of the inverse of A is equal to 1 over the determinant of A. So if we multiplied the matrix A by a scalar K, then the area of the pink parallelogram would be k squared times larger, and the area of the blue parallelogram would shrink by a factor of k squared. The blue parallelogram A inverse is rotated at 90 degrees to the pink parallelogram A. We can see this more clearly if we draw in each of the long diagonals. And finally, vector A1 is orthogonal to vector A superscript 2, a right angle there, and a vector A2 is orthogonal to vector A superscript 1. I've gone through these examples of matrices and their inverses to illustrate that matrix algebra is a more complex and interesting topic than you might first have imagined. In Module 3, I give an overview of how matrix algebra is used in economics.